This is Akashvani. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on regularization and mainstreaming of Ayush medications. The participants are Dr. Kostub Upadhyay, advisor, Ayush Ministry, and Lalima Aneja Dang, anchor. Ayush, the word denotes traditional and alternative system of medicine, and Ayush was made into an official ministry in 2014 by the present government. And during this period, as we all know, friends, the 21st of June has been declared as the International Yog Day, and it was happily accepted globally by the United Nations. Well, mainstreaming of Ayush is one of the strategies in the National Health Mission. And one main issue is that how do we regulate and standardize Ayush system, whether it is products, whether it is the resource people. For more on this, we are now joined by Dr. Kostava Upadhyay. Namaskar, sir, and welcome to the Akashwani Studios. Namaskar. So we find there is acute shortage of doctors in the rural parts of the country. The Prime Minister has often talked about being going local and increase in the importance of local products or local systems, be it medicine, be it herbs. Can Ayush practitioners fill this gap somewhat? As per the WHO requirement of patient-doctor's ratio, India is crossing the whatever the standard given by WHO because we have taken into consideration all the Ayush practitioners who are having their significant presence in the rural part of the country. And even our rural services also have significant manpower from the Ayush side. And Ayush side is especially doing wonderful job in giving services to the rural population of the country. Yes, but do you think that we need to standardize whether it is the degrees? We know we know that there are degrees for Ayurveda and systems are now being fallen into place. In our country, the mindset is such that we see traditional system of medicine and allopathy as two separate compartments. But globally, we see somewhat a synergy happening. People are talking about integrated system of medicine where one complements the other, whether it's allopathy complementing Ayush or Ayush complementing allopathy. How do you view this, sir? National Commission of Indian System of Medicine and National Commission of Homeopathy is regulating the education of eyes. And these eye systems are regulated since 1970s. And if doctors have given the vigorous training of five and a half years in both the traditional system and contemporary knowledge, these doctors have good knowledge of contemporary medicine as well as their traditional medicines. They are experts in their own traditional medicine as well as they are equally aware of the development that is happening in the contemporary treatment and contemporary allopathic system of medicine. 25,805 new seats have been added to this Aish uh, graduates since 2014-15 to 2021. That is almost 80% increase of the graduates. Actually, in 2014-15, we have 32,173 seats. Now, it is 57,978 in 21-22. Similarly, post-graduation is also three-year score where after graduation, these doctors will acquire higher knowledge, specialization, and we had 2,102 PG seats across the country, which is a 41% increase compared to 2014. So our doctors have equally good knowledge and good understanding of both the traditional and modern system of medicine and they are able to give proper treatment to the patient as per their requirement. Yes, because now that we see that many of the problems in this time and age are because of lifestyle disorders, especially in the urban belt, sometimes now we see a lot of such similar disorders in the rural areas also, like diabetes and heart attacks are now being seen in the rural belt also. So where other systems lack, Ayush fits in beautifully. So do you think that there is a process in place where we can standardize all the traditional systems of medicine and uh, so that there is wider acceptability of these systems? And how are we standardizing them? The standardization process has been started a long back. Ancient era itself, the knowledge which is uh, there in the different tribes and different people, that traditional knowledge has been formally codified and it has become a codified traditional knowledge. And in recently in the Biodiversity Amendment Act, also we have introduced this word, codified traditional knowledge. Drug and Cosmetic Act, these uh, schedule books are the classical reference books that have standardized the treatment protocols in this traditional system of medicines. And unless our medicine is mentioned in these traditional textbooks of the Schedule 1 of the Drug and Cosmetic Act, a manufacturer will not get the license to manufacture particular drug. It should be either directly formulation, directly mentioned in the traditional books, 
or combination of medicine mentioned in the traditional books for different purposes which are mentioned in the classical books. So it is already standardizing and even the education system is now very much standardized mm -hmm. and we need not have any hesitation to take any Irish medicine because entire process is standardized as on today. In this context, I'd like to know about the role of TKDL, the Traditional Knowledge Digital Library. The process has been on for the past many years and lakhs of pages have been digitized now from our ancient texts where the various formulations have been recorded for posterity. There has also been a threat to our own systems like Neem was wanting to be patented by America. We've had threat to our turmeric as well. Has TKDL helped protect our own traditional system so that the multinational corporations or the other um, organizations, especially in the Western countries, which don't have this kind of a traditional system of medicine, so that they don't take our formulations and patent them and thereby uh, capitalize unethically on our formulations. Traditional knowledge digital library is a digitalization of whatever existing prior art. That means the knowledge that existed in the various textbooks are in the form of oral traditions, all those things. They have been digitalized and put in the searchable format so that patent officers can search and find out whether this knowledge existed in the prior art, whether it was mentioned in any of these traditions or the textbooks. So, it is TKDL has been shared with many international patent officers mm -hmm. and usually whenever the claims comes, the patent officers will search in this digital library and if the reference to that prior art is found, they will deny the patent claim. So you think that TKDL has been successfully able to prevent the foreign or the unethical practice organizations to take the patents or the formulations from our system, right? TKDL has been of great help. It has been a great help, but there is a possibility of twisting the existing knowledge and giving a modern look to the same prior art and claim that it's a novel idea, novel process. But such things has to be examined on the basis of novelty and patent officers in India have been trained for this facility and the Aish Ministry is having interactions with the patent officers and we are in the process of formulating a IPR policy for Aish sector also. So moving on, do you think that standardization is a must? Because sometimes I feel, again, to be, let me play the devil's advocate, India has a lot of diversity as far as climate is concerned. You know, the same herb which is grown in different climate zones may have a different moisture content. So do you think sometimes standardization has to be soft? For example, when you look at cow's ghee, the cow which will eat plants in monsoon season will produce ghee which is of a different quality than the same cow eating herbs in summer season. So do you think that sometimes Sometimes standardization needs to be softened in the larger interest of the consumer. Standardization does not mean to fit a fixed scale. You should give a range because a standard depends on various factors. For example, haldi. Haldi from dry area, haldi from wet area like uh, Western Ghat, haldi from northeastern area, they have different qualities. What is the acceptable range? That has to be decided. Our pharmacopoeia commission, while deciding the standards, we take three samples each from three different geographical regions and we compare the result. We compare the result of all the nine samples and accordingly we will fix the range. So when we fix this range, which is reasonable, then able to compare all the variations which are possible in the normal variations which can be acceptable. So standards should be fixed based on the realities and the factors that affect the efficacy of the product as well as the quality of the medicine. A nice example you gave. When we standardize a product, especially an Ayurvedic product, a herb, so we do take into account the other variety of the other variables, may I put it that way. So we see now globally a renewed interest in Ayurved. Suddenly, you know, Ayurved has risen like a phoenix over the last few decades. And there is also a tremendous possibility of exports now. And it is happening also. Do you think we are geared up for exporting our Ayurvedic products abroad? Because there the norms are very strict. And sometimes uh, people have a different concept as far as uh, medicines are concerned like uh, they talk about metals in Ayurveda and so how does one explain that? The country's export was 2.85 billion US dollars in 2014 mm -hmm. and as of now it is 18.1 US billion dollars in 2021-22 and now it has reached 24 billion dollars. 
So this increase in exports shows what is the demand all around the world regarding ice traditional products. Regarding the standards, see the ice products in India are drugs. Under Drug and Cosmetic Act, it is considered as ASU drug or homeopathy drug. But when it go across the out of the country into the Western world, they don't recognize ice systems as a system of medicines. For them, it is a not a drug. If it is a drug, they need all of evidences. In India, because we have usage of this for 5,000 or more years, we have recognized schedule books and once the reference is in the schedule book, we consider it as a safe and efficacious and we will allow for the manufacturer to and give the license. But the same product, when it goes as a drug to the outside world, they demand clinical evidence, which is a very cost uh, taking. It involves a lot of cost involved. Mm -hmm. And for that purpose, under Drug and Cosmetic Act, we have made a provision that according to regulation of the importing country, they can change the label. For example, turmeric. Turmeric, whether it is a food or a medicine, in Ayurveda, the, whether it is food or a medicine is decided upon the dosage. How much turmeric you add in your food? Maximum half a spoon. If you put more than one spoon, you cannot eat that product. So that's why the dosage, the salt, the turmeric, the pepper, the pipali, all these things, jeera, all these things are food items, spices, but they will be considered as a potential medicines in Ayurveda. So what is the difference? It is only dosage. If dosage is minimum, it is a medicine. All these things which you commonly use in our traditional food, they are medicines and used in a minimum quantity. So, therefore, there is a very thin line of differentiation between the medicine and food in comparison to what is there in the allopathic side. So, accommodating this concept, we have introduced this uh, flexibility in our law mm -hmm. and even under FASAI regulations, 436 botanicals, they have given a recognition and they can be supplied as a nutraceuticals. So when there is a claim of any mitigation of the disease, then it will be treated as a drug. When there is no claim against specific mitigation of the disease, these botanicals can be considered as a food. So this is the thin line of differentiation between food and medicine in ice sector. And many of these foods have been used commonly in our households and they know what is the dosage how much it is to be used, when it has to be used, everything is there in the traditional cooking system of India. Exactly. So we need not worry about the any bad effect. Further, for export purposes, if any medicine has to be exported out of India, it has to be tested for aflatoxins, pesticide residues, microbial load and heavy metals. These are compulsory since 2008, this uh, system is there. So our product, without uh, getting tested in the accredited laboratories, they cannot be exported at all. So we have taken that keen interest in ensuring that our medicines are safe and free of contaminant when they are exported. Where do you think do we stand in insurance? We do understand that Ayush systems have been incorporated in insurance by the government. Where do you think we are at the moment, briefly, sir? Ayush coverage in the insurance products is there since 2018. And at present, we have total out of 316 insurance products, 259 products are covering ice systems. And out of that, 81 products are with the sublimits and 178 without the sublimits. And 68.7% of the products cover ice without sublimits. Ice ministry has constituted a core committee to ensue proper penetration of ice systems in the insurance sector and for advising government for monitoring insurance related claims and sensitizing the stakeholders mm -hmm. and to conduct a study on status of ice system of medicines and to come out with a white paper. And this committee is formed in 4th October 2023. Recently, mm -hmm. Insurance Regulatory Authority of India has come out with a guideline wherein it has made a compulsory that all insurance products in India should invariably have ice in its ambit and they should not have any differential treatment for ice interlia with the allopathy. Thank you very much Dr. Kostar Upadhyay for uh, talking to us at Akashwani. Thank you. Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on regularization and mainstreaming of Ayush medications. The participants were Dr. Kostub Upadhyay, Advisor, Ayush Ministry and Lalima Aneja Dang, Anchor. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of Akashwani.